Hi everyone, we're continuing our studies of the chemistry of life. Today we're going to focus on uh, forming bonds and specifically we'll look at our ionic and our covalent bonds. We'll also look at a special type of bond called the hydrogen bond and then the properties of water. Okay, so matter can be combined in two different ways, either physically intermixed as a mixture of which there are three types, suspensions, colloids, and solutions, or uh, matter can be chemically combined, in which case we're going to be forming and making new bonds. When we physically intermix um, and just form a mixture, we're not making new bonds. Our first type of mixture is a suspension, and that's a liquid mixed with a solid. You'll have a solution with particles suspended in it, and those particles will settle out as a sediment. And this is usually an opaque or cloudy sort of mixture. An example of this would be whole blood in a test tube, and the blood cells settle out from the uh, mixture. Um, and we use this uh, as a measure of a blood test called the erythrosedimentation, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or the ESR. And this test measures the rate of fall or sedimentation of red blood cells in a sample of blood that's been placed in a small, uh, thin vertical test tube. And the faster the rate is, an indicative, is indicative of inflammation in the body. Colloids are a type of suspension in which your solution of molecules contains um, uh, microscopic particles uh, that uh, do not uh, fall out of the solution. They, they remain solvated indefinitely. Examples of this are blood plasma, human milk, and in the hospital we'll order colloidal IVs uh, when somebody is very fluid depleted and we need to try to keep the fluid that we give them in their um, vascular compartment uh, a little bit longer. It stays in there a little bit longer than a saline solution, our typical normal saline IV would. We also have just general solutions, and these are solids, liquids, or gases that are mixed with a liquid that's usually the solvent water. And these are translucent. Here you have a sol solute, such as sodium chloride, that's dissolved in a solvent, such as water. Sodium chloride dissolved in water makes saline solution. Water is the solvent of the human body, and more typically, we'd say our body is in a bag of saline solution. When we're talking about uh, solutions, we often describe it in terms of its concentration or how much uh, solute is dissolved in the solvent. You can have a highly concentrated uh, solution. Um, here, where I have an example of 40 grams of sodium chloride dissolved in 60 milliliters of water which would be a 40% solution, that's much more concentrated than the example of the 10 gram solution or the 10% solution. Um, also, just to make it clear, when we're writing the concentration of a solution, we put that in brackets, okay? Matter can also be chemically combined, and this is when molecules are formed when two or more atoms are forming new chemical bonds. When they're forming new chemical bonds, our concern is with the valence electrons, because this is where all the action takes place, um, where the bonding forms. We'll have what's called the octet rule. Remember that we first fill up the 1s orbital with two electrons, and after that, our orbitals take eight electrons, okay? So our orbital is stable when it's full, such as with the noble gases. Either you're looking to get rid of electrons to go down uh, a level of orbital and have the most recently filled orbital, or you're looking to incorporate additional electrons in the orbital to reach the level of eight electrons and be filled and happy. When an atom's outer shell has a vacancy, it might have room for another electron, maybe two electrons, maybe three electrons. In the case of carbon, it has room for four electrons. 
So when you're missing electrons, it's chemically active. We also can have free radicals, and this is when atoms or molecules exist with unpaired electrons, and these are very unstable uh, molecules. They can even be dangerous to life. You'll uh, see a lot of advertisement uh, for your vitamins that um, are antioxidants, and they're looking to react with these free, free radicals to stop the damage. Um, you'll also see a lot of like facial creams uh, will be advertised as having antioxidant properties uh, so that uh, uh, it prevents uh, free radicals from harming your skin and doing damage to your complexion. All right, here we have the periodic table of the elements just to remind us of what all we're looking at. Remember, we have our uh, periods, which are the rows going across, our first period being uh, hydrogen and helium. We go across our periods and we fill up our nucleus with protons and those are positively charged. And when we put like one proton in with hydrogen, we will also then have one electron in an orbital uh, with its negative charge balancing the positive charge of the proton that's in the nucleus. In helium, we add in our second proton in the nucleus and then we add in an additional electron in our orbital and that would be the 1s orbital and then we're full okay and helium then has a completely filled valence and it is thus non-reactive it is a noble gas we go over to our second period and we start out with lithium we put an additional proton into our nucleus so we now have three protons in the nucleus and we will have our 1s orbital filled with our two electrons. And now we go to the next uh, valence or uh, electron shell in which we only have one electron, okay? According to the octet rule, we want eight. So we'd either be looking to fill it up with seven additional electrons, or we could get rid of the one electron and go back down to the 1s orbital and look like helium. Basically, when we're forming bonds, all of our um, atoms are trying to look like the noble gases. If we go across this period, let's say we go over here to nitrogen, which has its atomic number of seven. That means that it has seven protons in the nucleus or seven positive charges. It would then have seven electrons out in its orbital or its outer, va its outer valence would not have seven because remember the, the first intervalence would have two electrons. So we would have five electrons in our valence, okay? Five electrons in the valence. According to the octet rule, we're looking for eight. So nitrogen is looking to pick up three electrons or it could also look to get rid of some electrons and drop down. We'll see which ones it prefers and why later on. If we come over here to fluorine, fluorine has an uh, atomic number of nine, okay? That means it has nine protons in its nucleus and it will have nine electrons uh, orbiting the nucleus. Two will be in that inner shell and then in the next shell, we will have nine minus two or seven electrons. Our octet rule says that we want to have eight electrons, uh, at which point we wanna look like neon. So fluorine is going to be looking to pick up one extra electron. Now you can see at each column going across, you have 1a, 2a, 3a, 4a, 5a, 6a, 7a, and 8a. That will tell you how many electrons are in that outer valence. So when we're looking at 8a, these are all the noble gases their valence is completely filled and they are non-reactive. 7A means that there are seven electrons in that outer valence, and so they're looking to pick up one extra electron. In 6A, they are having six electrons in the outer valence, valence so they are looking to pick up two extra electrons. And you can see what we'll learn is that down over here at the end where you have 6A and 7A, it's going to be easier for those 
to pick up an extra electron and get close to filling up their, their valence um, just by adding in electrons. Whereas down here at the end where we had lithium and sodium, they're in column 1A, lithium, sodium, potassium. And these atoms are going to look to get rid of an electron, okay? Because it's easier to get rid of one than it is to pick up an additional seven. Okay, so let's look at sodium more closely. Sodium we can see is right below lithium. It's in that third period or the third row and it's in column 1A. So we know that it has that one extra electron in its outer valence. Okay, so let's look at sodium here. Sodium, its atomic number is 11. That means it has 11 protons in the nucleus. So down here in this purple nucleus, there's 11 positively charged protons. Balancing that, we will have 11 elect electrons encircling it in its orbital. When we fill up the orbitals, we start filling up first with one and two electrons of opposite spin in our inner 1s orbital. Then when we go up to the next orbital level, so we're already at, we filled up two in our inner, inner orbital, we go to the next electron orbital or electron shell. Okay, so we start out with our third electron. So we fill in three, we fill in four, we fill in five, we fill in six, we fill in seven, we fill in eight, we fill in nine, and we fill in 10. So now we filled in eight in our second shell, two in our first shell, we filled in 10, and we have one more. And that one more has to go out to the next higher energy level or valence, the outer orbital, right? The outer electron shell, and we place just one there. And it could take up to seven more, all right? But as I told you, it's going to be easier for it to lose this one electron than it will be for it to gain seven. So this electron loss is what you see over here in this column. You see all these vacant orbitals that are not or, or sorry, vacant electron uh, uh, spots in this outer orbital, right? Okay, and to look like a noble gas, we're just going to get rid of this whole valence or this whole orbital out here by losing this electron. So we're going to lose this electron and sodium will go down to just having these two orbitals and it will look like the noble gas that dropped down to just 10 electrons, which is neon on the periodic, periodic chart if we go back here, okay? So sodium is now looking a lot like neon here, and that's what all these atoms are trying to do. However, when we lose that one electron, we now have still the 11 positive charges of the protons in our nucleus, and we only have 10 electrons with their negative charges balancing that. So our sodium in losing that electron is now a charged molecule, which we learned last time, makes it an ion. And it makes it specifically a cation with its positive charge, plus one, okay? Now, if I asked you in your mind to figure out the same thing with potassium, okay? If we figured it out with potassium with its 19 protons, could you try and do that? And let's see if you had this right. So potassium has an atomic number of 19, an atomic weight of 39. In the nucleus, it therefore has 19 protons that are positively charged and has 19 electrons that are circling about in the electron shells. You can see here in the 1s orbital, the one that's closest to the nucleus, we have proton one and two. Then in our second shell, we have eight more protons for a total of 10. Then we have in our third shell, which is filled all the way with another octet, 
eight more protons for a total of 18 electrons. And then we have our 19th lone proton out here in the outer valence. Of course, just as with sodium, we're going to find that potassium is inclined to get rid of that outer proton in that outer valence. Just like this, okay? We'll see how it gets stripped of that and usually forms an ionic bond, at which point we're left with 18 electrons for a total positive charge cation. Potassium becomes K plus. Remember the symbol for potassium is K. So it's similar to the same situation that we had with sodium, okay? They're in the same column, the 1A column, you'll find sodium, potassium, lithium, they all tend to lose one electron and form a positively charged cation, positive, pos positively charged plus one because they lose one electron. Okay, when they lose this electron, they become ionized. They're formally called ions. They're atoms with an unequal number of protons and electrons. Okay, so as I said, in the case of potassium and sodium, they will carry that net charge of plus one and are called cations. Chloride in the seventh group will gain that electron. Okay, this chloride is looking to fill its outer valence and it has seven electrons out there in the outer valence. One more electron fills it and it then looks like a noble gas, okay? So it takes that electron from the sodium. And that's why you see then sodium and chloride like to live in a relationship together as sodium chloride, because sodium will then be positively charged, chloride will be negatively charged, and opposite charges attract. So this is what happens when we form our ionic bond. We've gener sodium lost its one electron out here in this outer valence, and it now resides spinning around, dancing around out there with chlorine and the chlorine atom, okay? Chlorine now becomes an anion with a negative one charge and is called chloride, okay? It's a chloride anion. Sodium chloride. It's an ionic bond because they are held together by the mutual attraction of their opposite charges. And here we go again, just another view so that we really get this in our head. Our sodium atom had one electron, lone electron unpaired out in its outer valence, okay? Remember all of our uh, electron shells like to have an octet of four pairs of electrons. Those pairs of electrons are of opposite spin. I'm telling you that, but really for our purposes, you don't need to pay attention to the properties of the uh, electron spin in that. But we get rid of the one electron in this outer valence, and then we have a noble gas configuration because we have a filled octet in this electron shell that is below it. The loss of electron gives us an ionized sodium that then carries a positive charge because it's lost one negative charge. Our chloride, chlorine atom that's been looking to pick up another electron because it has a space right out here in its outer valence and that electron from sodium will fill it it gains it, and then we have our chloride anion. It gains a negative charge, so chloride now has a minus one charge. And here's our valency table again, and you'll see that group one, column one, these all look and behave just like sodium. 
and they tend to lose one electron in their relations in their ionic relationships and they tend to therefore have relationships with this group seven set of elements or atoms fluorine chlorine bromine bromine iodine okay and these all tend to accept one electron because they have seven electrons in their outer valence and they become completely filled with the addition of one. In the column before them, oxygen, sulfur, um, these all have, um, are looking for two electrons. They have six electrons in their outer valence, okay? And so forth. You can see that uh, is pretty obvious with, with the whole periodic table. So I, in ionic bonds, the atoms are held together by the mutual attraction of the opposite charges that form when these atoms either lose an electron or gain an electron and become cations and anions. And the cations are attracted to the anions. And so this can be, form a quite strong bond. And you'll see as sodium chloride, it just doesn't dissipate or crumble in, you know, uh, become non-chemically bonded. Salt is very stable sitting on your table for years and years and years. And it forms this lattice uh, relationship of one sodium and chloride to each other. You can see the relationship there. But we're not being concerned with the structure of, of salts, thankfully. <clears throat> All right, so now let's look again at our ionic board our ionic bond formation, looking at the period two valences. And we'll see how like when lithium gains its proton and uh, moving on from helium, gains one more proton, has three protons, it has three electrons. The next electron goes up into the next orbital. Beryllium, same thing. It gains a proton, uh, changing it from lithium to beryllium. And then we have four electrons encircling uh, in the electron clouds around the nucleus. Boron then has five protons and of course, five electrons, okay? So it's got this odd number of three out here in its outer valence. Carbon now has four protons in its nucleus. And so therefore, I'm sorry, it has six protons in its nucleus and it now has six electrons encircling it. So it has um, four in its outer valence and so forth down the line all the way to neon, which then has 10 protons in its nucleus, two in the 1s orbital right here. And then its next orbital is a complete filled octet for a total of 10 electrons. We also can write our valence in a notation, which is called the Lewis dot structure. And you'll see that this becomes very, very useful for all of our molecules. So we have lithium with its one dot indicating that it looks like this. It has one in its outer orbital. For beryllium, you could write B, E, and you could write two dots for beryllium, okay? Carbon, will write its outer valence. We leave the filled inner valence. We ignore that when we write our Lewis dot structures. And we write carbon with its four electrons unpaired surrounding it, okay? Nitrogen, we will write it's one, two, three, four Lewis dot structure. And then it's additional one is paired. So on nitrogen, you have this lone electron pair up here. For oxygen, same thing. You write one, two, three, four in its outer valence, and then it has 
five and six. And you have to write it like that so that you get the key thing of the two lone electron pairs out here. You don't end up filling it like this. You don't say one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, because then they're all paired off. And you'll see this is significant for the way that it forms bonds. Fluorine, I could write one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And you see that it's looking for creating its last lone electron pair to fill its octet. Okay, now let's erase all this so that we can move on to our next slide and not have that show up on our next slide. Okay. All right, so lithium operates much the same as does sodium chloride. Lithium gives up its one electron from its outer valence, and it will donate that electron basically to fluorine, right? To the fluorine atom. So it become, forms the substance lithium fluoride, okay? And really lithium would have a plus charge if we were writing that here, okay? And fluorine would have a minus charge, but since the overall uh, molecule that's formed is uncharged, we leave that off, but this really becomes, like I said, lithium plus one and fluorine minus one, okay? And we could have written the Lewis dot structures for lithium and fluorine. And you'll see here why these dot structures become very important. So lithium, has its lone electron pair, one drawn in. Fluorine has one, two, it's in group seven, so it has seven out here, three, four, five, six, and seven. And then you see how these two become the ones that are exchanged, where lithium donates this electron over here to fluorine. And that's where the bond is formed. So the Lewis dot structure basically shows you how your bonds are going to form. All right. So now that we've looked at our ionic bonds, we're now going to look at covalent bonds. And this is where you really like to use the Lewis dot structures. Our covalent bonds will form when two atoms share a pair of electrons rather than donating or stealing an electron, okay? These can be stronger than ionic bonds. They can be weaker than ionic bonds. Um, they're not always stronger. Um, but some of the textbooks kind of allude to this fact because when we're talking about putting these things in a solution, an aqueous solution, what happens with the ionic uh, bonds is that the ions dissociate or the bond kind of falls apart in water. And we'll show you why that happens in a moment. Um, so, but don't get confused to think that those bonds for like table salt, sodium chloride is itself weak. It is not, it's a very strong bond. It would take a lot of energy to break that bond. However, in an aqueous solution, um, you'll see that uh, charged molecules will dissociate from each other. Okay, so in our covalent bonds, we have here just a basic hydrogen atom and another hydrogen atom with its one proton in its nucleus for each atom and its one electron in its electron shell, 
okay, in the outer valence of hydrogen, which happens to be the 1s orbital. And what happens is since each of these um, hydrogen atoms would like to have a second atom to fill its orbital, it doesn't really want to give up one and form one that's an H minus and one that's an H plus. There's um, no reason why one hydrogen atom, since they are exactly the same, would pull away an electron or attract that electron more than the other hydrogen atom. So what they end up doing is becoming involved in a shared relationship. And so, oops, if we were drawing with our Lewis dot structure, we'd annotate this of our hydrogen atom with an H with its lone electron. We'd have another hydrogen atom and it's H with its lone electron. And we draw it as shared like this. And that's the one single bond, okay? And this is a model of hydrogen gas, H2, okay? Forming its covalent relationship, equal sharing of the electrons, okay? So what's happening here is these um, hydrogen, the electrons are dancing around each of the hydrogen atoms but it has no preference really for dancing around one atom more than another, okay? And it shares equal time around both of the nuclei, the electrons do. And I have lost my mouse cursor here. Where is it? Completely gone. There it is. All right. Okay. We see in our covalent bond formation that we have a single covalent bond forming between these two hydrogen atoms to form the hydrogen molecule. As I said, we can see down here how we have our two hydrogen uh, atoms, each having one proton in its nucleus. As these hydrogens combine, you're not going to have one hydrogen atom stripping the other hydrogen atom of its electron. Um, you, there, there's, this nucleus is, is equally strong to attract an electron and hold it within a cloud around it as is this nucleus, okay? So they end up sharing it equally. And these electrons spend equal time moving around, dancing around both of the, the nuclear cores of these atoms, okay? All right, so when we have our co covalent bond formation, we will have structural formulas. And that's where we drew that line between the two atoms of the hydrogens that indicated they shared a single covalent bond, equal sharing of the, of the electrons between the two nuclei of the atoms. We can also have double bonds, okay? And this is when you have two atoms sharing two pairs of electrons. And it's a stronger bond than a single bond. And we can also have triple bonds where we share three pairs of electrons. And that's a shorter and stronger bond even than the double bond. Very hard to break. So let's look at these. We have our Hydrogen atom up here, it's nonpolar. We'll learn about polar in a minute. And this means that basically we have our two electrons that are going to be shared by the two nuclei of these two atoms. And these electrons are going to spend as much time around one nucleus as they will around the other. All right. Now, when we get into oxygen, we're going to form molecular oxygen. We're going to form a double bond, all right? So when we look at oxygen, oxygen first has two uh, electrons in its inner 1s orbital, all right? And then for oxygen, we're going to add in one, two, three, four, five, and six 
electrons in the next shell. Oxygen has an atomic number of eight, two in the inner uh, orbit, orbital, and then six in the outer orbital. We fill, when you're filling your orbitals, you have to fill your orbital first all single, and then start adding the doubles. As I said previously, the last thing you wanna do is to go filling in electrons as pairs first, okay? You do not do this, where you're in your oxygen orbital and you have six, six electrons to fill in this valence. You don't do it one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? That is wrong. Okay. You always will fill it. Let's get that annotation back. Oop, doesn't want to do that. You always want to fill it one two, three, four, five, six. And then you'll see oxygen is going to try to fill a spot out here and try to fill a spot here and form two new bonds of two new pairs. All right, let's erase this whole thing. Okay, so looking at oxygen, we have our two like this, and we'll see, we have oxygen up here, um, one oxygen molecule, another oxygen molecule, and we will share one pair here and one pair here. And then we form what's called a double bond, okay? So that's our two oxygens bonded together. Now this is written like an O equals O, O double bonded to O. Don't forget that you also have two lone electron pairs still outside here. That will become very important. Now, this is all for um, atoms where the nuclei are the same. Now let's start forming a covalent bond when we have different nuclei. And here we're going to form a covalent bond for water, where we have a hydrogen, an oxygen, and another hydrogen. Here, you're going to see that you have this big oxygen nucleus that has eight protons in it. You have this little hydrogen nucleus that has one proton in it. So this oxygen atom is very, uh, oxygen nucleus with the eight protons is very strongly going to attract that um, electron from the hydrogen, all right? And it's going to pull that electron toward it. Same thing with this one. It's going to pull this electron toward this oxygen nucleus with the eight protons in here. We have our eight protons. If I can get back there. We have eight protons, right? Eight protons that are positive, positive charge, okay? And so it's going to pull that. We're going to form a bond here, and we're going to form a bond here. Whoops, makes it look like a double or triple bond. It's just a single bond, okay? And then we have our molecule looking like this right now. But we'll see why this becomes significant that we have that big electronegative nucleus of this oxygen uh, atom in one second. All right, so we form, formed what 
what were called covalent bonds, and now we're getting into the two different types. When we had hydrogen bonded to hydrogen and oxygen bonded to oxygen, we formed what were called nonpolar covalent bonds. We had equal sharing of the electrons because the nuclei was always the same. You know, one hydrogen and one another hydrogen. There's no preferential attraction of the electrons toward one nuclei or the other. They're exactly the same. We will form some polar covalent bonds where we have unequal sharing of electrons because one of the nuclei will more strongly attract and pull on those electrons. And when we form these polar covalent bonds, this will be like in water where the electrons are going to be more attracted and pulled away by that nucleus of the oxygen preferentially over the hydrogen, okay? And we call that oxygen then a very electronegative atom. And what we say is it has almost a, in this covalent bond, it has kind of a partial ionic character to it or a partial, a little bit of a charge. It's not a full charge, like in an ionic bond, but it's a little baby charge. And we give it a partial charge, we give it a delta, we call it a delta, uh, Greek letter charge, for polar molecules like water. So let's look at this. And we really need to spend some time understanding it. Okay, so we have our ionic bond, which is formed by our completely uh, unique nuclei where one, one nucleus so strongly attracts the electrons that it basically strips the electron away from the other uh, atom, okay? And this would be like in sodium chloride, okay? Chloride is a much bigger uh, nucleus than is sodium, and it's going to very strongly att attract that electron away from the sodium and actually take and steal that electron away. Okay, so sodium ends up with a positive charge and chloride ends up with a negative charge. And the two atoms then remain associated with each other because of the opposite charges uh, being the attractive force between those two atoms. Here we had um, a polar, nonpolar covalent bond at the other end of the spectrum because that is our say our two hydrogen atoms, same nucleus. It's not going to attract an electron more than another nucleus that looks just like it. So this is a nonpolar, completely covalent, there's no charge involved situation for our hydrogen. Then we have molecules that are somewhere in the middle, and this would be like water, okay? where our oxygen molecule is going to much more strongly attract uh, the electrons than the hydrogen, but not so strong that it completely strips and takes away the um, uh, electrons off of the hydrogen. The electron is still going to dance around the hydrogen, but it's going to dance less frequently around the hydrogen. It's going to spend more of its time in the cloud around the oxygen. So we call this a polar covalent bond and our oxygen will carry a partially negative charge and our hydrogen will carry a partially positive charge. All right. When I talk about electronegativity, I'm talking about is a measure of the atom's tendency to pull electrons away. And here is a chart that will tell you. It's basically a vector. You have increasing negativity as you go across a row from 1A, uh, these small little cations over here. Um, these will, uh, you know, obviously form in an ionic relationship. 
they don't hang on to that outer valence electron easily, okay? They're not strongly attracted to the core of, of this nucleus of these atoms. Whereas these atoms down here near the noble gases and the halogens, the group 7A um, atoms, these atoms, their nuclei very strongly will attract the atoms, uh, the electrons. And so we call these more electronegative. Also, as you go up the column, you become more electronegative. So argon is more electronegative than, well, let's, we won't use the noble gases. Chlor chlorine is more electronegative than bromine, which is more electronegative than iodine. Fluorine is about the most electronegative molecule there is. So you see you have vectors going in this way and a vector going in this way. So you can somewhat think to yourself that basically as I'm going in this direction, that atom is going to be the atom which is stripping the electrons away and the electrons will dance around it a whole lot more. So if we see that we get a relationship between oxygen and sodiums, oxygen would tend to take the electrons away. Sodium would tend to uh, um, carry a, a partial positive charge. If we had a relationship between um, chloride and carbon, okay? So if we looked at these molecules and we see that carbon is in row um, 4A, okay? And chlorine is in column 7A. Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. So chlorine is going to end up having to pull the electrons probably more in that direction. Fluorine and carbon, fluorine is more electronegative so the electrons will spend more of their time around fluorine and so forth, okay? Fluorine back down over here, carbon over here. You just have to look at the chart and you can kind of figure it out for yourself. All right, so let's take this arrow off of here and then let's move on. All right, so I kind of think of it this way, again, when we form an ionic bond, we're actually, think of it in terms of you're transferring an electron and you make completely charged molecules. At the other end of the spectrum, you have a nonpolar covalent bond, like between a hydrogen and a hydrogen or the two oxygens being bonded together. You'll see that when we have carbon bonded to hydrogens, same thing. Neither one of these is a highly electronegative um, atom, and it's not really going to have a propensity to spend any more time around the carbon or the hydrogens. So carbon, which has this Lewis dot structure like this, and is looking to form four pairs when it gets together with four hydrogens, it'll form a molecule looking like this, hydrogens, hydrogen, and this ends up being a nonpolar molecule. And you, it's very important that you start to think of carbons bonded to hydrogens. We'll learn a term called hydrocarbon for that. And our hydrocarbons are very nonpolar molecules. The electrons in the shared relationship will dance around the hydrogen molecule in its relationship as much as it will spend time around the carbon, okay? Nonpolar. Now, when we get into things like our water, um, then we have polar covalent bonding. And we're going to have unequal sharing of our electrons. The electrons will spend much more time dancing around the more electronegative atom, which will often be oxygen or nitrogen. And when you see these 
atoms that tend to have these lone electron pairs hanging out on them, you can also, that's a clue or a trigger for you to think of them as an electronegative atom, an electronegative, uh, uh, it will then form polar relationships. Oxygen and nitrogen will almost always form polar, you know, be a polar area in a molecule, okay? All right, so when this happens, we're forming our polar covalent bonds in something like water. Okay, so our oxygen, remember, had its six electrons in its outer valence, two that are formed in these alone electron pairs, and then you had one here and another one over here that were unpaired, and the valence gets filled when it gets, involved in a sharing or covalent relationship with hydrogen, which has its one electron in its valence. So hydrogen shared with oxygen is full and oxygen shared with two different hydrogens is full. This, elect this oxygen atom, as I said, is a highly electronegative atom and it's going to pull the electrons to spend more time in this shared relationship, more of the time will be around this oxygen. And since the electrons will spend more of their time around this oxygen, that means that it's going to have a partially negative charge. So I write delta, partial negative, okay, at this end of the molecule, because this molecule has shape with these covalent bonds you see. And so this will be a little like negative tip. And each of these ends of the hydrogen, since the electrons are being pulled away from them, they're kind of exposed, almost like their little proton in the core is exposed. It's not shielded or balanced by the negative charge of the electron because the electron barely is spending any time hovering about those hydrogens. So these hydrogens have a partial negative or delta plus charge on them. Again, delta plus, partial plus, because it's only a partial charge. It's not a full charge like in an ionic relationship, okay? All right, so in our water, we have two hydrogen atoms that are covalently bonded to oxygen to form the water molecule. As we said, it's a polar molecule where we have an unequal distribution of charges. And because of this unequal distribution of charges, and this is why it's important and why it's especially important for a water molecule, it's going to form a new type of bond at these partially charged sites. And this is called a hydrogen bond. Now, I kind of hate the term calling it a hydrogen bond because it isn't actually a formal bond. It's more of a loose association, okay? But the word technically that we use, that chemists have traditionally used to describe it is a hydrogen bond, so we're stuck with it. But think of it as a loose association. It's not like a strong covalent bond. Okay, so let's remind ourselves we have a partially negative charge on our oxygen because these electrons that are bonded, forming the bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen are going to spend more time encircling about the nuclear core of this oxygen. The electrons are pulled toward it. So our hydrogens, recall, are a little bit exposed because we have our single proton here without the shield or the covering or the dancing about of the negative charge around it. Why this becomes important then is you'll see when we have one water molecule next to a wa another water molecule next to another water molecule next to another. So you have millions of these molecules when you hold up a whole cup of water is that they align with each other in a specific manner. So our oxygen, the bigger molecule here, the red one, with its partial negative charge, will line up against the water molecule that's next to it 
with its pos partial positive charge of its hydrogens pointing toward that oxygen, okay? And then the other hydrogen is going to point toward the negatively, partially negative oxygen on another water molecule and so forth. And the oxygen on this original molecule here is going to be partially negative charged and it will align against the partially positive charged hydrogen on another molecule. And we could go on and draw this and draw this over and over again. And you see this little dot, dot, dot means loose association, hydrogen bond, not a formal bond between all these molecules. Okay. All right. Take a deep breath and let's think of something that trips everybody up. We have here within one water molecule, covalent bonds. Our hydrogen is covalently bonded to the oxygen. The other hydrogen, H2, are the H's, the hydrogens are covalently bonded to the oxygen molecule. And they form this little Mickey Mouse shape, right? Every little Mickey Mouse, every molecule here is loosely associated to the molecule next to each other. So we have our covalent bonds within the molecule, the intramolecular covalent bonds, but between our molecules, the intermolecular is the loose association of the hydrogen bonds, where that oxygen from one molecule of water is going to face toward or align up and associate with the partial positive charge of the water molecule next to it. So you have an intra within a single individual molecule of water, all covalently bonded, okay? But between the separate different water molecules, the loose association of one being hydrogen bonded to the next water molecule, okay? So between molecules and within a molecule. Within a molecule, covalent bonds, between the two different molecules of water, hydrogen bonds. All right, and we're going to hammer this in through our heads. So we're gonna keep saying it over and over again so you get these questions right on your examinations. And so that you start getting to understanding it because it will become important for a lot of reactions in our body. Otherwise, we wouldn't bother going over this. Okay, so again, we look at our one single molecule of water, where we have our individual atoms covalently bonded to each other. The covalently bonded hydrogen to the oxygen, okay? That means they're sharing electrons that are dancing around both of these nuclear cores of the oxygen and the hydrogen, and they're just spending a lot more time dancing around the oxygen than they do the hydrogen, okay? So we end up with a polar molecule is covalently bonded, but it has a slightly negative charge at the end of the oxygen and slightly positive charges at the little tips of the hydrogens. All right, one water molecule. Now we move over to how two individual molecules of water associate with each other. And this is our hydrogen bond written by a dot, 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 or a dash, dash, dash. And this is where our partial positive charge on our hydrogen, delta plus, okay, kind of flirts with or looks over at the partial negative charge on the oxygen over at the molecule across from it. And they just kind of like to line up against each other, okay? Sort of flirt and look over at each other but they're not forming a formal bond. It's that loose association, all right? And you're going to find that there are hundreds and hundreds and millions and millions of these depending on how many molecules you have. So you'll have another oxygen bonded to two hydrogens as water over here, and they will line up. These are the covalent bonds within one molecule. And we'll have a delta negative on our oxygens that will form loose associations 
with the delta positive on the hydrogen of the water molecule next to it. And it will be so on and so forth all throughout a whole beaker of water. Now, why is this so important, you, you wonder? Well, this hydrogen bonding will confer a lot of interesting properties in water in particular. So let's go through hydrogen bonding. It is an attraction between the covalently bonded hydrogen atom on one molecule and another atom that's taking part in a separate polarly covalently bonded molecule. All right, two different molecules. It's an attraction between two molecules. The OH bond on one water molecule is going to point toward the lone pair of electrons on its neighboring water molecule, okay? It's not a formal chemical bond. Again, it's a loose association or attraction. These H bonds can be easily separated, unlike a covalent bond. It's difficult to separate. But the key thing is, is that there will be, like I said, millions of them, because you have a beaker of water, you're going to have millions of water molecules in there. So it's additive, it's an additive effect. One hydrogen bond, two hydrogen bonds, three hydrogen bonds, to a million hydrogen bonds, then the effect is kind of big, okay? And it's going to give the liquid water its special properties and the properties that actually make life on Earth possible, okay? And it's not just between oxygen and hydrogen, and it's not just water molecules. Other molecules will form hydrogen bonds, and they'll have these polar partial charges. You can see here some other uh, associations. We could have, you know, your nitrogen, bonded, covalently bonded to a hydrogen, oxygen covalently bonded to hydrogen, the nitrogen covalently bonded to the hydrogen is going to act very much like the OH, okay? It's also going to be partly negative at the nitrogen end and partly positive at the hydrogen end. Same thing if you had fluorine covalently bonded to a hydrogen, okay? So, the hydrogen bonds can form within other molecules. We're also, we're, you know, we'll be concerned about some of these other molecules when they, they associate, but you really need to get it down in the water. But I don't want you to think that it's only in water, okay? So water gets unique properties from hydrogen bonding. The water molecule itself has no formal charge to it. Okay, it's an uncharged molecule. All the charges are balanced. However, the oxygen tip of it is slightly negative as oxygen is more electronegative and pulls the electrons toward it. Whereas our hydrogens are partially positive. Okay, and we say that our OH bond has a 33% ionic character. It's highly polar. It's slightly charged, but to a pretty good degree charged, 33%. So what properties does this confer? Well, one of the properties it confers is cohesion, the tendency for water molecules to stick together, okay? And this creates surface tension in water, all right? water molecules will stick together and beat up. If you drop water on your car, you have little water droplets, right? The rain drops on it, it beads up. Water doesn't just flow off and separate, right? It forms little droplets that will stick together on a surface because that tendency to have those little partial charges helps keeping those molecules stuck together, all right? As well as at cohesion, it confers the property 
of adhesion, the tendency for the water molecules to be attracted to or stick to other substances or surfaces, like the underside of a leaf. If you go out after it rains and there's plants, not only is the water beating up on the leaves, but it will also like stick to the leaves so the water doesn't just go running straight off of all the leaves, okay? And this adhesive property will be uh, uh, also cause what's known as capillary, capillary action. So what's capillary action? Well, if you put a slim tube like a straw in your glass of water, you'll see that the water climbs up the straw, okay? If you pour water in a measuring cup and the slimmer the tube or the measuring cup is, you'll see it kind of climbs up the edges of the cup itself. And we use this property when you go into a laboratory You've probably learned about looking for the meniscus when you measure in a graduated cylinder. And let's see if I could draw a meniscus on here. So if you had a graduated cylinder in your lab and you had, you know, the mark for like say 10 milliliters, 10 milliliters in the cylinder, 10 milliliter mark, right? And you had five milliliters down here and here's like the base of the cylinder and you pour it up with water, you're going to find the water kind of loops up right here. And so maybe we'd have this at the 10.1 mark. You read it at the bottom of the meniscus. You don't count the water that's creeping up the edge. And most of you probably learned that when you took chemistry in high school. It creeps up the edge of the tube. Okay, so that cohesion of cohesive property of water and where, where we said it had that surface tension that ex exerts that pull on each uh, um, water molecule toward the other one. This is what allows things like an insect to walk across the surface of, of a water, uh, of a pool of water or a droplet of water because there's tension, you know, a little tension or a little force uh, given to that um, surface of the water. Okay, other properties that hydrogen bonding confers on water is the high boiling point of water, okay? Other liquids, like an alcohol, for instance, um, they will um, boil at a much, much lower temperature than water. And this is because what are you doing when you go from wa water in its liquid form to, to the gas form? Is you're breaking apart, you know, the molecules, right? One from the other. You're diffusing them. We just did a diffusion lab. And diffusion, you in increase the chaos or the entropy when you apply heat. And the molecules move farther apart from each other. So they are no longer in liquid form, they're in gas form. Well, if all those individual water molecules are associated with each other through hydrogen bonds, even though each bond itself isn't super strong, um, the association of one with the other, with the other, with the other, um, you have to apply a lot more heat to break apart those associations, okay? So water has a high, boiling point because of hydrogen bonding. And liquid water then is needed by all living organisms. And it enables life uh, to survive on this planet. And this is why we always go looking for water as a sign of life, why the Mars rover is out there searching for water on Mars. Another property that hydrogen bonding confers is high specific heat. Just like it requires a lot of energy to raise or lower the temperature for a boiling point, it does so for also evaporating water. When our water is evaporating as sweat, it's carrying away a lot of the energy in the form of heat from our body in those bonds that are being released, okay? So, Evaporation of sweat will allow for the cooling of an organism, and this is very important, right? It helps us maintain 
homeostasis and keep an even body temperature, taking away heat from the body, okay? Hydrogen bonding and water also will affect the density in the solid form, the density of ice. Below zero degrees, which is the melting point of water, ice is solid water, right? So unlike most substances, which become more condensed or denser in its solid state, um, water expands because these hydrogen bonds helps while it brings the molecules closer together in alignment or association, it also gives kind of a structure or lattice to it in that state and keeps them held apart at a specific distance, okay? So uh, solid water is less dense and therefore it will float on liquid water. This gives it the property of having solid ice insulate, right? When ice is floating on water so that you don't freeze from the bottom up. You have a layer that freezes on top and that will insulate the rest of the water from freezing below it. And this is significant because then our ponds and our lakes don't freeze all the way through and you can still have life forms swimming and moving fish moving down below the ice. Anyone who's gone ice fishing knows this. And this was significant for life to develop and evolve over time on earth and eventually evolve. And the fish walked out of water and got legs, right? And you see your little Darwin with its legs fish on people's bumpers all around. Okay, so here we see, this is why the same property that, that we were just talking about, that ice is less dense than the liquid form and why it floats on water. So the sheets of ice form on the surface of ponds and lakes and stream and allows uh, life forms to, uh, to live under that protective ice blanket. Okay, hydrogen bonds will also uh, make water our beloved solvent, right? So polar substances will, you'll find, undergo dissociation in water. The hydrogen bonds will absorb heat and will also provide a temperature buffer, okay, at, in this solvent. It's going to require a lot of heat applied to separate water's hydrogen bonds. And this is going to keep it liquid at ambient temperatures. And you'll find that water is often a reactant or a product in many chemical reactions throughout um, all the chemical reactions in our body. All right, so water as a solvent, you need to know a couple of terms. And one is the word hydrophilic. Hydro meaning water, philic meaning loving. So hydrophilic substances dissolve easily in water. They are water loving substances. And we tend to think of this in terms of like dissolves like. So you will find water itself is a polar substance and it will similarly dissolve other polar substances or substances that have a charge to them partial or full charge, all right? Water will then make solutions or uniform mixtures of substances, like we will see when salt dissolves in water. Salt, NaCl, as we've learned, is a charged or ionic substance. And so it is attracted, as in like dissolving like, to another charged or partially charged or polar substance such as water. And this is how we solvate something. So we have our sodium chloride crystals of our Na plus and Cl minus. And when we put it in water, even though this is a very strong, strongly bonded, ionically bonded substance, what you see is in water, 
it dissociates or falls apart in all the water molecules, how they solvate the sodium is that all of those partially negative oxygens will align around that positively charged sodium. Conversely, all the positively, partially positive charged hydrogens in the water molecules will align around the negatively charged chloride ions. And it will keep the positively charged sodium apart or away from the negatively charged chloride ion. And this relationship will happen millions of times over for all the sodium and chloride ions that will be dissolved or solvated in water. And you see this here. Again, water is a solvent. The chloride is separated or dissociated from the sodium cation. The negatively or partially negative, ne negatively charged oxygens in the polar water molecules will align around the positively charged sodium cation, whereas all the partially positively charged hydrogens will similarly align around the negatively charged anion of the chloride anion. All right, again, when we talk about something that is dissolved in a solvent forming a solution, we talk about how much solute is dissolved in a given amount of the fluid. And we will symbolize it in brackets to indicate that we're talking about a concentration. And that concentration might be given as a percent, like the percent of sodium dissolved in water, or the percent, uh, or we might just talk about grams per liter, um, or we might even talk about moles per liter. And we really don't need to get into the molar amounts too much in this class. All right, so we're not going to start racking our brains with the concept of what a mole is in Avogadro's number. All right. Okay, so we talked about hydrophilic substances, things that are charged or polar, okay, and so they will dissolve in water. We also have plenty of hydrophobic substances. These are water fearing or water dreading substances. And they aren't going to interact with water because they aren't charged, okay? So water's not going to dissolve them and dissociate and then uh, separate the charges like they do around sodium and chloride, for instance. These are going to be nonpolar substances, okay? Substances without a charge. And so that will be things like long chains of hydrocarbons. And as we went over previously, carbon with a hydrogen, carbon bonded to a hydrogen over and over again. Carbon isn't really more electronegative, much more electronegative than is a hydrogen. So when carbon and hydrogen form covalent bonds, they share the electrons between them equally. The electrons will dance around the carbon as much as it will around the hydrogen. Okay, so these are nonpolar substances and you can't dissolve these things in water. Things like fat, okay? You will come to learn that our fats, you will see are long, long chains of carbons and hydrogens, relatively nonpolar. And you know this, when you dump uh, olive oil in water, it floats. It doesn't mix in, right? And because it's less dense, it floats as opposed to sinking. But something that is more dense, like maybe Crisco, might float down at the bottom, okay? Aside.